Welcome to the podcast, Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where I connect authors with their readers. We also talk all about the author's inspiration, their journey to publication, and the authors will educate me and you, the listener, all about the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter, also known as the Author's Librarian. Hi there, listeners. It's the host and producer, Vicki J. Carter, here of this podcast, The Authors of the Pacific Northwest. And before we jump into the episode, I wanted to stop real quickly and share with you the newest project that I'm working on. If you are an author, I think you might be interested in it. I have a YouTube channel that I just launched called The Author's Librarian on YouTube. And on that YouTube channel, I am going to share with you free accessible resources that you can use to help you with researching. I'm going to give you tips. I'm also interviewing librarians and I'm writing a book to help authors with researching. So I hope you find me there on that YouTube channel. You can find the link in the show notes. Now let's get to the program. So hi there, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for coming back to the Authors of the Pacific Northwest. And yes, it has been a while since I've been on a show with you guys. And I'm so happy to introduce you to our author. Our author's name is Tommy Black. So Tommy, say hello to everyone. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. I am glad to have you. So um, we're just going to jump right in and let's talk a little bit about you. So tell us first um, where you live, what state in the Pacific Northwest you're from. I live in Washington State, which I know a lot of the people that you have on are in Washington State. I am just outside of Seattle on Vashon Island. I love Vashon Island. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people love Vashon. Yeah. Have you, how long have you been there? Because it's one of those places that you can't buy a place there now without a and arm a leg. You cannot. I got so lucky. I bought my place over 20 years ago. And wow. my boyfriend and I at the time were just coming out here camping on his family's lands. And, and we were kind of fixing it up. And they said, don't do that. We're going to sell it. And so we bought it together. And it's such a Vashon story. We ended up breaking up shortly after that and then it was a long long saga but i ended up with the property how oh, lucky you <laughs> yeah well i paid him for it yeah yeah i would have done the same thing i'm like i want to stay here so we went there a while ago and we stayed in airbnb and um we got to stay right on the water on the mm -hmm. where the well it's so gorgeous and i woke up with the front the window that we're seeing is old, old, like Victorian home with the window open and the water sounds. And I was like, I'm in love. I need to move here. <laughs> <laughs> but I love anything near water, especially on our Puget Sound, any of the sound. It's gorgeous here. Yeah. Lucky to be here. Definitely. Most of the time. <laughs> it's good. Um, okay. So are you currently a full-time authorist or do you, do you have, what's your background? Kind of walk us through what your background is. Well, um, I am mostly writing now, but that's because of COVID. Um, I have been working on many novels for, uh, for years, uh, but I finally, in 2021, published my first novel. So COVID, um, I lost my job. I was a tour manager for a band and haven't towards since, but that gave me more time to focus on my writing. So in a way, it was a blessing. It was a blessing for the writing part, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So cool. So uh, tour manager for a band, a woman after my own heart, because <laughs> I don't <laughs> know much of my story, um, but I lived on the road with my husband for 11 years. We raised our kids on tour with a band. And so I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I I was the supportive tour wife merch girl. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah. And we raised the kids and they, they have very fond memories of going to a lot of festivals and of falling asleep behind the merch table. You would understand this falling asleep <laughs> behind the merch table because I was doing merch and they'd have to, you know, we'd be out late and then we'd cram everybody in the van and take off to the next show. And the girls would have two benches in the van to sleep in and seven adults. <laughs> that is Excellent. My daughter would have loved that. She lifestyle. <laughs> would often come out and visit with my husband when, 
you know, just for a couple of days while I'm on tour, they'd meet me somewhere. And, and that was so exciting for her. She, if she would have done anything to be on the road with me. Yeah, it was great. And then they got to the age where I was like, okay, we're going to go back. We're going to, they're going to be in school. I'm not going to do what we called, we were going to call it road schooling. And I was going to homeschool them on the road. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we need some stability and this isn't going to work. So we ended up, I stayed home. My husband did tour for another, I think, four years without us. Wow. And um, so he, I called him Disneyland Dad because he would fly <laughs> in from a day and be home for just a weekend and do all the fun stuff with the kids. Yeah. Off. And then I'm like, oh, here I gotta go and get them all established again. <laughs> it was a great lifestyle, but <laughs> demand it though, as I'm sure you understand. Demanding. And I, I always feel like it's a young person's game. I mean, I was doing it just a couple of yeah. years ago, but it was short tours and it was with a very different kind of band. It was uh, uh, Deva Pramal and Matan, who are the yoga chanting music. So yeah. very sweet group of people to be with, short tours. Good group of people to be around and stuff. No, that's true. I, I felt like it was a young person's game too. So I was more than happy to get out of the game and come home. And I went back to school, raised the kids while my husband did it until, I mean, he toured until he was well past his 40s, way past his 40s. Huh. So yeah. Yeah. So he was like, okay, well, I think I'm done for a while. I'm like, okay, good. Let's have a normal life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we got a lot in common. So you published one book this year you've been writing but you published one book this year so what's the genre of the book it is literary fiction um it's called where are we tomorrow and it's about four women working backstage on a rock tour oh so cool (laughs) all of that experience brought into um you know kind of the contemplation of women in a male-dominated industry yeah yeah Definitely. And, you know, the whole girls behind that backstage, the whole supportive role and the, all of that then is so true. So I'm very excited to dig a little bit into your writing process or your story of the, of the book. So tell us a little bit. Um, so are there characters you drew from your experience on the road and do they know who they are? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. When I started this, I, I actually didn't want to write about being on the road. I was so tired of it. Um, but I just thought, well, you know, it might do all right. I'm going to, I'm going to just sketch this out. And I did base it on three or four of the women that I toured with. Uh, when I was with Nora Jones, there were women on that tour and it was so unusual there's usually you're the only you probably experienced this you or one other woman maybe in catering was a mm-hmm. woman everybody else men 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 everywhere you turn and so I just thought it was so unusual I'm going to just write a little bit about these women and I don't know if I ever thought well it would actually come out and this would be a project that I would stick with <laughs> yeah how did they feel about it have, and have they read it um, yes, they have all read it and they were so beautiful about it. And, you know, when I, I sent it to them before it came out and I said, just remember, this is fiction. The, you are all fictionalized. You will notice, you'll recognize yourself, you know, in these characters. You will, you maybe have the same job. You look like these characters, but it's not you. I made up your story and they were, they were very gracious about it. There were, um, one of the women took a little exception because her story is so different than the woman's story. She thought, everybody's going to think that's me. And I said, you know, I'll say it everywhere. It is not you. And um, yeah, they're, they're very different, but they're based on these women. That's so great. I, I'm excited. I definitely am going to read the book because I have in the background. Um, so I write historical fiction and I'm working on my second story right my second book right now and i'm sorry if you guys can hear my dogs barking in the background um i'm at the stage where today i can't even manage that so we're just gonna let us now <laughs> it is right um they're not behaving well and um so i have a storyline in my head where i want to write a book around my husband's history but not in from our perspective well i mean 
obviously we're going to draw from our perspective, but have a different character altogether, but around the whole Pacific Northwest scene, because he has a huge background from the Pacific Northwest, Portland and Seattle, Portland and stuff. So I thought that would be a lot of fun and kind of add in there some stuff that from characters. And I've always wondered how that would work with people reading it. Like, I know who this person is, Vicky. You're just ratting me out. <laughs> yeah, I had a bit of that. And um, I think you just have to roll with that. I mean, we write what we write. It wasn't intentional to write these characters, but it's yeah. just what what happened. And um, yeah, I think that you you have to have, a, as you know, a lot of thick skin yeah. when you're a writer and only care so much. <laughs> yeah. So is your is your story um, taking a line between the stories of all three men? Does it follow? them in their own person or is that well, one what's the point of view of the story it's, is it one person it's an omniscience it's mm-hmm. the, uh, even a close third a roving close third i think nowadays you mm-hmm. can kind of get away with a little bit more i uh i i sort of based the point of view on uh the art of fielding do you know that book mm-hmm. uh, yeah yeah uh he he did such a great job with his point of view that I thought, I think I want to try to do that. I want to try to get this really close third, but sort of an omniscient so that you could tell the stories of all of these people. Um, but there is one main protagonist. Her name is Alex and she's the electrician on the tour. Um, and then a second um, sort of like maybe the second protagonist that these are the two uh, she is the assistant to the star who is mm-hmm. really awful. And I just have to say, because I have to say it everywhere, the star is nothing like Nora Jones. Yes. Nothing. And I love it. <laughs> when, when she went out, yeah, she said, do you think people are going to think this is me? And it's, I, I can't imagine anybody would think it was her. She's just oh. completely opposite. So it kind of is almost easier to write an opposite character from somebody else that, you know, if, for me, writing a villain is so easy. You know, yeah. I love writing villains, you know, and also writing somebody that's got like their personality type. I'll have them pictured in my head, but then I'll be like, no, I'm going to do completely opposite from what I know this person to be. And it's almost easier that way. Yeah. Me. So, so that, that's really cool. So did you keep this kind of part of the writing process? Did you keep journals throughout your whole? time at you know while you're on the road or did you just remember kind of all these facts and just wove them into the story I did keep journals I what I did was on one particular tour I actually wrote letters home to that's cool my then boyfriend now husband and it was sort of a journal and I would just send them via email um, so I did a lot of that, which I think really informed a lot of this story. And then a lot of memories. Um, I have a ton of photographs, books, you know, yeah. tour books, things like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I yeah. feel like I was swamped in material for this particular book compared to my other projects. Yeah, that's so cool. The, the idea of the stories, uh, letters going back home, you know, that's such a great, great way of having a memory if it's not a drill like you're sending letters back home that's that's almost romantic i love it yeah (laughs) so um publishing wise were you are you self-published or did you um like i heard you say contracts i'm guessing that you pitched this to an agent and they took it and ran with it and you got uh well tradition not quite so tiny the journey (laughs) i it's such a journey it's so different for all of us right um, yeah, it, is. it is a small publisher. Their name it's Touchpoint Press, and I went straight to them because I I did uh, pitch this different drafts of it over the years uh, to agents, had some interest. Nobody ended up picking it up, and so I finally just thought, oh, here's a couple of presses I see that might really like this kind of book. And uh, Touchpoint, they were excellent. They came back and they said. We are interested in it, but we think it has a few issues. If you want to redraft it and send it back to us, we'll let you know. And I took about three or four months and redrafted it, took their suggestions and went back to them. And they said, yep, we'll take it. So nice, nice. Yeah, I got really lucky that I found them. Um, 
they're they're such a family and they've actually they're actually going to publish my second novel as well oh good let's talk about that hold on a second question (laughs) so you found them did and you didn't have an agent you just found them and you pitched to them yourself yep and i think a lot of people are doing that these days with the small presses a lot of small presses will now take pitches directly from authors and for me it's been a really great relationship um just very approachable, easy to talk to the other authors. We all have a Facebook page that we communicate with. Uh, they have about 150 authors that they work with. Oh, that's great. And it's also great to have that community for marketing. <laughs> because marketing yeah. is the beast. Because even if you have a publishing house, you have to do 90% of your marketing. You know, Everybody so. told me that. And I thought, yeah. What? I'm just going to hire somebody to do it for me. How's that going for you? <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I'm learning a lot, a lot. Yeah. Yes, listeners, we laugh because it's true. We all think we're going to have somebody help us and we're going to have a marketing team or hire. And it, it's, a, you know, we still end up doing a lot of it. So, so I totally get that. Um, so what, what would be, like one of your suggestions because I have a lot of aspiring authors or authors that are just getting started to publish as far as your learning curve on the marketing aspect. Oh, it is. (laughs) I was terrified of, I was not on social media. I had no platform to speak of. I had a Facebook account that I hadn't logged into for about 10 years. I couldn't (laughs) find the password. Oh, you know, it, yeah, I was the worst as far as marketing went. And I went so far as to hire some PR people. I thought they'll help me. And, um, and you know, they've done some stuff, but it was not what I wanted. What I wanted was somebody to just do it for me. And that mm-hmm. just can't be the case because nobody knows my life like I do. Nobody has all of the resources. I have all the photos, all of the yeah. thoughts. So yeah. I really had to take a step back. Um, I read, uh, I don't know if you know Beth Giussino. Um, She is a local editor and that writer. Sounds very familiar. I'm sure I've read her stuff. Yes. <laughs> I, I went to a workshop of hers at the PNWA um, mm-hmm. conference one year, and she had a marketing book, and I bought that. And she taught me a lot about, look, you don't have to be an expert at everything, but you do have to choose the ones you're comfortable with. Yeah. And so... That really helped me go, okay, I think I'm going to be comfortable on Instagram. And so that's sort of mm-hmm. where I put my efforts and I took classes yeah. on how to do Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I could tell you the classes I've taken on Instagram about how to do Instagram. I love Instagram, though. And it really does yeah. lend for writers. I feel like, especially for you, because you have such a great resource of your photos that you can, and, you know, tying that into your life that you had prior that markets for the book. Not everybody has that amazing resource. Um, so, and Instagram just lends so well to visual, um, yeah. whereas Twitter's, you know, typing and writing and, and tech. I can't, can't do it. I I just can't. I do. I have my two quick two Twitter accounts and I have my two Instagram accounts and I have two Facebook accounts. <laughs> but you will find me on Instagram. You will see me engaging a hundred percent more on Instagram than anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. It well for me once I qu- sort of wrapped my head around the fact that it this isn't. Think of it as an art project. Don't think yeah. of it as marketing. Think of it as yep. a, a visual. I was a painter before I was a writer, and oh, so I thought. Yeah. I can, I can do this. I can do yeah. visual. So I can do this for me. <laughs> and then I love talking about writing. I love talking about books. And so um, going to bookstores is good for me when I can. There aren't many that are doing that right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, and, and podcasts are excellent. I even started my own. <laughs> oh, you did. Tell us about it. Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, we've only got three episodes out so far. It's called The Personal Element. And a friend and I from grad school, another writer, we take personal essays that we like and we have the author read them and then we discuss what we like about them. Oh, that's very, very cool. So, so when um, I put out this podcast, you guys, you'll send me all the information so my listeners can come and find your podcast as well. Sure. 
That's really a great idea. I like that idea. Yeah, I the podcast for me, podcasting has been the number one accelerator for everything for me, from learning from authors, from learning how to um, promote and market. It's all started with the podcast because I wasn't writing when I started the podcast. I was just starting to write. And my whole premise for the podcast was, I don't know anything about writing and absolutely nothing about publishing. And so I'm going to ask people questions and, you know, come and find some authors that don't have a community. And so I interviewed two or three authors. I'm like, oh, you know, I just actually was talking to them in email and on um, Facebook or face to face. Like, man, I can't be the only one in the world that's having these questions. Right? <laughs> so let's put it in a podcast. So I came home to my husband. I said, I'm going to start a podcast. He's like, wait, you don't know anything about podcasting. <laughs> It can't be that hard, honey, seriously. And so I need to buy me a mic and I need this. And, you know, so he's like, okay, let's go for it. And so from that, I built this huge author community, writing community around me as I was writing my first book. And um, and then from there, uh, so many people that came to the podcast found I was a librarian. And then the questions were like, how do you do research? Well, and so that started the first book I actually published. <laughs> Let's read the, the I started a book, but that's all I published. So so the podcast has been such a great instrument for me for learning, I mean, and for meeting new people and also getting to expose so many people to other authors that they might not have known about. So I applaud you and your friend. Keep doing it. Thanks. It's fun. And yeah, and when you hit that wall that's not funny more, email me. I'll tell you to keep doing it. <laughs> that's great. Because <laughs> I've hit that wall many, many times. I bet. Yeah, you have a lot of episodes. I do. I wish I, that I had found you while I was going through all of this. I would have learned a lot. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I did. My first year, I did an episode or two a week. And um, so that built up quite a bit of episodes. And then the second year, I was doing one every two weeks. And now I'm down to an episode a month because I am yep. trying to write, too. And um the podcast is so great, but it can take over, you know, as much energy as a book or publishing a book and um, promoting your book. So I have, I mean, I'm only one woman. <laughs> so I've got to sit yeah. down somewhere. <laughs> I could see that. We're only doing one a month. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, and I think that's perfect. Um, all the advice I've been given is to do what's best for you, you know, and I didn't take that advice. I'm like, I'm just going to keep going until I drop. <laughs> Dropped. <laughs> <laughs> So very cool. I love it. Great. Love, love, love. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the support groups as you were doing your writing. Um, you already mentioned one that's very well known to my listeners and to us in the Pacific Northwest, but did you have any other organizations or writing groups that you can mention or talk about? Yes. I, I They're so crucial to the writing process. I have a writer's group here on Vashon Island and, um, there are five of us and we meet monthly. We have been for years and years. Um, and then I also have a group from my MFA program that and the one of the people I'm doing the podcast with, but there are also four or five of us that keep in contact. We used to do, when we first got out of school, we do yearly retreats together, but those have faded away, but we still talk all the time. Yeah, life gets busy, right? <laughs> yeah, but trading work with them and having their input is really crucial. And then once for me, once I've burned all of that, once they've seen the manuscript too many times and have about as much perspective as I do about it, then I tend to hire an editor, like just a freelance editor, a developmental yeah. editor. Yeah. That's what I did with Where Are We Tomorrow and uh, so helpful if you find the right person. Exactly. Yeah. That's such great advice. So let me ask you this question because we'll go back to the editor here in just a minute. But mm -hmm. I've had a lot, well, there's a lot of debate, but I've had a lot of conversations with people that ha don't have a formal education as far as you you have the Masters of Fine Art, which was, I'm guessing, around literature writing. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yes. Um, and so... There's quite this interesting discussion that I hear in both camps because I am in academic work full time. And then I'm also in the writing community, right? And so I get like 
I hear both sides of the story. There's a lot of people that think that the masters of fine arts, especially in literature, can really hinder people from freedom in writing. Like it, it structures it too much. So, and I always thought that was an interesting idea because I'm all for higher education. Like the only reason why I didn't finish a doctorate was because I decided to put all the energy into writing and not go get a doctorate right now because there's no reason for it. Yeah. So have you, do you feel like your education was a hindrance or do you think it was um, beneficial for you? I understand what people are saying about that, about structure and you could maybe change and, you know, while you're learning craft, you can kill the artistic side of you. But I think it's a crucial step to learn that craft because you can bring back who you are as a writer. For me, it was, it, it made all the difference to go and get my MFA. But I was older when I did that. I was, well, at the time, I thought I was older. I was 37. Um, <laughs> uh, a young one. Yeah, I was. <laughs> but when I, the first day, this is one of my favorite stories. The first day I walked on the campus, I walked into the registrar's office and one of the other students turned to me and said, oh, are you one of the professors? <laughs> like, <laughs> I would hate that. <laughs> ah. um, but I, I wasn't the oldest person in the program <laughs> by any means. Um, but I feel like it was crucial for me to, number one, feel confident in my writing um, because I, yeah, I was just doing it by myself in my room for years without even putting it out there at all. So to step into a community, I, I often say the first time I felt like I actually belonged anywhere was when I stepped on that campus and met the other writers. And I went, oh, this is my place. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, really important step in my writing um, development. But it doesn't mean that somebody else who has also been writing for years, who is confident, who is um, doing well, it, it, you don't need it to be a published author. But and you can also just take a bunch of classes. But other people's mm -hmm. input is very important, whoever it is. Yeah, and I probably need to backtrack a little bit on the structure of where that kind of conversation I've heard that kind of rhetoric came from individuals that had been burnt by criticism in groom because I I don't know about you but when I first started I mean I was writing in the closet was I told everybody nobody knew <laughs> my husband knew I was writing that was it and I was terrified because I'm I'm severely dyslexic I had a speech impediment when I was a child so writing was not my strong suit even though I loved books and I loved stories uh, writing them was painful for me. I just couldn't get what was in my head on the words, right? So criticism or getting critiques would have been terrifying for me up to about four years ago when I landed in the perfect writer's group where it was not a negative criticism. So I think where I hear, I've heard that before and so much when I think about it is people that have gone through programs and don't have to be a higher education program it could be a critique group or a writer's group that really um wasn't kind or constructive with their criticisms yeah i think that's a really important point is that no matter where you go it has to be somewhere where you feel safe and you feel supported because there's certainly a way to do it wrong in a in a critique group and yeah. Our egos are so fragile, oh, especially when we first start, maybe always. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it, it's really important not to crush a new writer, definitely. Yeah, that's so true. Well, thanks for indulging me on that conversation. because <laughs> I, I, I think it's an important conversation. And I'm not sure I've had many. Now, okay, you guys, if you're listening to this, you've been on my podcast and I'm putting my foot in my mouth. I apologize. I don't know if I've had many people that have had their Masters of Fine Art. I could probably name about five of the authors that have been on that have. So it's an interesting academic discussion I love to have with people <laughs> because I'm stuck in that sometimes. Um, but so support groups are so, so valuable. Um, so let's backtrack to the editor part that you mentioned. 
because this was another part that I was really scared of when I first got started because of my my writing issues. I was like, man, I'm going to be paying someone a lot of money because they're going to take a lot of time to go through this. My experience with my first editor for the book that's out now, the um, Research Like a Library book, it was nonfiction. So I think it was a little easier to edit um, on my own. But also my editor was phenomenal. It changed my life to have my manuscript go to somebody. And yes, I did pay and I paid very well for it. And I got back so many fabulous comments and helpful insight. And I'm like, oh, now I get what everybody's talking about. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. A good editor is incredible. And I got so lucky. Well, first of all, because my uh, grad school professor, uh, A.J. Verdell, worked with me after I graduated when I went back to her and said I could use some help with this manuscript. She was amazing. And then we both took it as far as we felt we could take it together. And I let it rest for a year. Thought, oh, maybe it's just not going to do anything. And was sort of about to give up when I, on a whim, uh, found this editor, um, He had a, his name's Philip Elliott, and he has a um, a, a literary magazine. And he was running a special for, uh, like, send your short story or the first chapter of a book, and I'll edit it for 20 bucks, something cheap, you know. And I said, I'll just just send him the first chapter of the book, see what he thinks. And he is a music lover. He is this excellent writer himself. And um, when I hired him, I find this kind of funny. Uh, he came back and said, I love this. You know, I'd be willing to do a developmental edit for you if you're stuck. And so we negotiated a price. And so I said, Oh my God. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's expensive, but I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I kind of looked him up a little bit more, which I probably should have done before I hired him. <laughs> um, uh, and found out he was maybe 23. Oh my and God. I thought, Oh, no. How's he going to, what's he going to think about this book about like women in their mid thirties that are trying to figure out what they're going to do with them, you know, have children, not like what? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, he was amazing. He came back with, and he loved the book. So for me, I was like, oh, if that young guy is going to like this book, I think, I think this book's going to do something. And, well, yeah, um, because he's like that market audience that you really want to try to capture for anything with rock and roll. You want kind of the younger yeah. generation that wants to know the history because my kids are all about history of rock and roll. That's all they want to know about. You know what I mean? Like they love yeah. the current stuff, but you they want to know that stuff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I got really lucky with Philip and he's been such a great supporter of the book the whole time. And he's a brilliant editor. It's, it was incredible. I was like, how do you know so much at that age? Yeah, I know. Mm. He's just a natural. That's such a great thing. Yeah. And I would say my advice to other writers would be to, if you're going to hire an editor, you could get lucky like me, but I think the best thing is word of mouth. Ask other writers who they've used and, um, and take their advice. Yeah, I said, yeah. I, I went to my my group of authors that have been on this podcast because I had you guys all in a Facebook group, close Facebook group, which I never post in there. So don't worry if we get you in there. It won't be like something that's high maintenance. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I keep forgetting. I'm like, oh, my God. But I, I messaged some of them. I said, okay, it's time for me to have it. And they've been cheering me on, right? Because they're like been on this journey with me. And they're like, oh, we have all these people. Check out this person and check out this person. And I'm like, man, I'm so lucky. And when it came to, because I decided to self-publish this first book because it's a nonfiction book. And so I thought it'd just be easier to get it out there. And so when it came for beta readers, I had more beta readers than I could get my hands on. I, I just was overwhelmed at how... Many of my, the author friends that I've made from this podcast, if we want to read this book about research. And so I I, plenty. So it was great. So definitely find your community. (laughs) Definitely. definitely. Okay. So let's backtrack before we jump into the reading of the current book that you wanted to read from. Did you have, 
other titles or this is your first published title? This is my first published one. Um, and the one that's coming out next year is a historical fiction. So, so cool. I wish that I had had your book <laughs> as I was writing that one. <laughs> um, because I just wanted to talk quickly about that process because yes, I'm more of a literary fiction writer. I, for me, it was the story that I wrote the story without really doing any research. It's set in 1913 on in coastal Maine on an estate. Um, and the, it was the story I was trying to write. And so then I had that manuscript for a while and then finally realized I didn't do enough research on this. Like I got some notes back that were like, hmm, did they really have that at this era? You know, or <laughs> their language seems inappropriate. Yeah. And and then I realized, oh, I need to go back and really research this era. And so I did and think and by doing that, um, and I mainly just read books about the era. Um, my family's from that area. So I asked my mom about things and had some um letters from relatives and things like that. Ooh, but that's um, cool. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a whole saga behind that. But um the uh it it was surprising to me how I had not really thought to do that ahead of time. I, I was listening to your article with Megan Chant and she talked yeah. about how she researches first, researches yep. first, and I thought, oh, that's the opposite of what I do. Not everybody does though, so don't feel bad. <laughs> it's just <laughs> the librarian preaching about it. Um and sometimes I'll be off oh, okay, I'm gonna be honest here. I'll get a storyline and I'll do some of the pre-writing before I go do research because sometimes you don't know what you need to research. Like, yeah. you don't know what questions you need to go look for or what, what like in your case, yours will, well, did that actually, did, did that exist at that time frame, right? Right. So, so it's totally acceptable to write the storyline, in my opinion, as the first draft. So <laughs> and, then, and then to go back and do the research because, um, a lot of times you don't have to know the questions, but then there's people like me who are research junkies and all I can do is research all the time and I have too many book ideas. So I have yeah. to like stop and just focus in on the research of this time period. But no, that honestly, your, what you're talking about is very, very normal. The things that I love to talk about with authors is um, how to make sure that you're researching well so you're not just stuck in one resource meaning Google and Wikipedia, <laughs> which I bash all the time. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm like a big basher on that kind of, you know, that. Um, but no, most authors will have their storyline and then realize, oh, there's pieces that are missing. And how else do you know your questions unless you know what the storyline is about or what time frame and those kind of things. So that's totally normal. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, I even had to change the year of the uh, the story when I went back. And to realize, yeah. oh, they they weren't allowed to have automobiles here at that point, well, Jan. Yeah, totally. I did the same thing with my first book that's not out yet. So it, I call it my practice book, but it was, I planted it first in um, Queen Elizabeth's era. So that would have been um, Shakespeare time and had written the whole first draft and loved it. The, the storyline, the female character was fantastic. Um, but then where I wanted her and her storyline to go in the second and third book was too many. It was almost a century apart. And I'm like, oh, crud. So I had to go back and rewrite the whole storyline from the first one to get her to that place so that she could end up at the very end of the story in history where I wanted her to be. <laughs> yeah. It took me a whole first draft to figure that out. So, you know, it happens to all of us. <laughs> Good to know. Okay, so you have your literary fiction that is based on the rock and roll um, whole scene persona, and then you have one that's coming out, this historical fiction, that will be out mm -hmm. this year. So the one that you're going to read from is your, tell us the title, so I'm not messing you up. Yeah, yeah this is Where Are We Tomorrow. This is the rock where, and roll one. Where Are We Tomorrow. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to read from that. I'm going to go quiet and listen to you read. Okay, I'm going to read from chapter three, which is... It's not the protagonist chapter, chapter, but I really love this chapter. It's about Lily, the, um, the assistant to the star. 
Chapter 3. At nearly 1 a.m. across New York, there was no sign that the party was dying. In clubs on the Lower East Side, at galleries in Soho, in lofts uptown, and in warehouses downtown, highs were peaking. Eyes dilated. Fingernails scratched at prickly skin. Conversations turned to what users thought of as deep, but to the few who were sober, who were there to see art, eat food, or quell the loneliness, those conversations sounded ridiculous and shallow. Lily watched the posers, Sadie's followers and hangers-on, as they swarmed around and tried to win Sadie's favor with jokes and stories. Lily had noticed that each person in her boss's entourage seemed to host some aspect of Sadie's personality, maybe a trait that she couldn't afford to portray. Usually, there was a loud, bellicose type, a mousy, studious person, maybe a drunk or a cackling burnout. All night at Sadie's loft in Tribeca, two up-and-coming fashion designers recounted tales of Fashion Week in Milan, or Milano, as they pronounced it, both with heavily faked Italian accents. Lily knew where they lived, in Brooklyn. Lily couldn't engage with any more farce than what she already dealt with nightly. Sadie on stage, Sadie feigning sincerity, Sadie in the throes of distress when she felt snubbed or disrespected, wandering around her apartment swearing in the Chilean Spanish she learned from her father, Juan Guadillo and Andante la Chucha. It took weeks for Sadie to finish fretting after she caught a headline in the USA Today. Slam dancers, sexy Sadie poised over the pit with an accompanying photo of her in Rio balanced on tiptoe near the edge of the stage while the dancer doubled over from the blow. Time eventually lessened the intensity of Sadie's embarrassment. Shame was easily buried, Lily knew, by proceeding to the next adventure by surrounding yourself with people who flattered you, thus the late-night party. So Lily didn't join in the conversation. She pretended she was a waiter and treaded the perimeter with a plastered-on smile, quietly orbiting the couches around the fireplace. Once she established that nobody needed a drink, she sank into an empty brown leather armchair, clutching a lambskin pillow. Only six people lingered, the vestiges that followed Sadie and Lily home from the back room at Bungalow 8 in Chelsea, and an intimate few for a Saturday night. Lily knew how it would go. They'd all refused to leave until they were forced to, until they were escorted to the foyer, coats pressed into hands, until the elevator door slid closed, and they continued to gaze yearningly over Lily's shoulder for a last glimpse of Sadie. Oh, bravo. <laughs> like you know, that orbit well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bravo, except for my, oh, I know that I am just butchering that Spanish. You okay. can tell I don't speak Spanish. That's okay. I will I won't <laughs> hold you to that because I almost butcher every author's name in English from this podcast. So very, very good. So so that's exciting. That one is out now for my listeners. They can find it now, right? So I'll mm-hmm. make sure that's in show notes, how they find that. And your second book will be out when, what's the title of the second book? Do you have one? Well, the title we're using right now is called Sarah Bell. I don't know if we'll keep it and it should be out next fall, hopefully. Oh, how exciting. Well, after that, I'll have to have you back on so we talk all about historical fiction too. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, okay. So you said um, to us that you're on Instagram um, and, and we, I'll put your, you have a website also. We can have the website and show. I do. I do. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So before we go, I like to ask this one question. Um, If you can give some parting advice to authors that aren't where you're at, we don't have books published or we're just getting started. What would that advice be? I would definitely say, don't be afraid to dig back into your manuscript. If somebody tells you that it's not ready, it's probably not ready. We all thought it, like, we just can't possibly go back into it, but you can, you can, you can fix it. It's fixable. It's doable. Just keep on with it. Oh, such great advice. Just keep on with it, everybody. I love that advice. So thank you. So before we go, you guys, I'm going to do a couple shameless little plugs because I'm very terrible at getting all my information out to people. 
So this month, um, so this will be coming out in October, so probably first of October. And this month, I have a um, self-publishing conference that I'm a, um, one of the presenters for. So you can find out that information and sign up for three free days of um, the writer's crafts. Well, it's all about the writer's crafts. Some heavy hitters in publishing are out there. They're going to be joining me as presenters. So hope to see you there. And also I'm on a podcast episode out with Joanna Pinn, which will be coming out um, from the creative pin at the end of this month. And we talk all about researching. So um, hope to see you there. David, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you being on the show. Thank and you so much. It was a joy. And we'll definitely have you back after the next book because we're going to talk all about um, historical fiction with you. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Make sure you jump on the show notes and find the author, buy their books, write a review. And most importantly, you can find out more about me and my projects at one of my two websites, www.squishpin.com or theauthorslibrarian.com. And until next time, this is Vicki J. Carter, the Authors Librarian, signing off.